Okay, well, welcome everybody to um, Victoria University. Thank you very much for giving up your lunch time to come along and um, participate in this event. My name is Nicole Moram. I'm an associate professor here um, on the faculty, and I'm giving this presentation along with Martin Betkie, PhD candidate here at Vic, um, who's sitting there at the front. Now, as you're hopefully all aware, the topic of this talk is privacy, why should we care? And we're going to divide it into three roughly equal sections. So the first one, I'm going to talk about um, exposure, which I'll explain a little bit more in a moment. Um, Martin is then going to talk about data acquisition, particularly in the commercial context. And then the final third of the talk will be devoted to questions and any comments that you might have from the floor. So we hope to wind up at about quarter past one. So... Exposure. Why should we care about breaches of privacy that involve exposure? Or more particularly, the question that I want to address in this part of the, sec of this part of the talk is why do we care about um, breaches of privacy that, that involve exposure? Because I think it's reasonably safe for me to assume that most of us are affected somehow if somebody breaches our privacy by finding out information about us or by looking at us or listening to us when we're engaged in something which wasn't intended for their observation. The question I want to look at then is not so much why should we care, but how do we articulate the feelings which I think most of us do have about what's wrong with that, about why we don't like it when somebody breaches our privacy by exposing us. Well, before we answer that question, I think we need to look at a prior one, and that is, what do I mean or what do we mean when we talk about privacy, particularly when we're talking about privacy in the context of exposure? And I think there are two main aspects to this which have been widely accepted both by lawyers and by theorists. And the first one is that you can breach a person's privacy by finding out something about them, by finding out private information about them. Now, most of us can probably imagine what a breach of this nature might look like. There are lots of classic examples of private information that m many people share similar feelings about. I've got some examples that, um, that are typical in the case law and in theory. One is medical information. Most people have something in their medical records that they don't want disclosed. Maybe they've got an STD or they've had an abortion maybe they've got the sexual dysfunction or incontinence, anything like that. Maybe they've got ingrown toenails, but most of us don't have something in our medical records that we don't want shared. Sexual information is another classic example. Few people want all of the details of their sexual lives and history made public. Sometimes we're a bit sensitive about financial information. Sometimes that's because we're perhaps not as well healed as we look. Sometimes it's because we're better healed than we look. So we have... Another, so another example of um, kind of information that some people might regard as private. So that's the first category. Fairly well understood, finding out private information about someone against their wishes. There's a second category as well. This one is about looking at someone or listening to them or recording them against their wishes. Now, sometimes when you do this, you'll find out information about somebody, but not necessarily. Because often the objection in a situation like this is actually just to the looking or to the listening or to the recording itself. It's what I sometimes call the creepy talk, the creepy stuff. So to use um, an example from the leading New Zealand case and the leading Aterian um, case in Canada, maybe our flatmate or our landlord is videoing us in the shower without us knowing. Or this is a headline from, from last week, maybe there's a guy who likes to check into the hotel room beside us so that he can use a peephole to have a look at what we're doing in the room. Maybe we had the misfortune to check into the motel room of this guy who um, installed hidden vents in the ceiling of the motel so that he could watch paying guests having sex in the units over a period of 29 years. I'll tell you what, if you look at the US case law for too long, you start to get very paranoid when you go into a motel room or a service station toilet. That's one set of examples, but maybe someone's photographed us when we're in shock or we've just had a trauma. This boy's father's just been shot in front of him and he's being led into a hospital. Maybe we're overcome with grief or with some other extreme emotion that we'd normally wish to keep behind closed doors. Now, both of these types of privacy, 
finding out information about somebody and looking at or listening to a person have been recognised by New Zealand courts as key parts of the privacy interest. And so that's what I mean when I talk about privacy by exposure. So why do we care about it? Well, how do we articulate why we care about it so that the importance of this interest can be weighed appropriately against other important interests like freedom of expression or access to justice? Well, the answer to that question that is most often given is that privacy is important because it's an essential aspect of dignity and autonomy. So it's widely accepted by judges and by theorists that privacy is important because it's part of our ability to choose how and to whom we reveal ourselves is an essential part of what it is to be human. So we say it's a fundamental part of our dignity that we should be able to make decisions about that aspect of our lives. Now the flip side of that is that to breach someone's privacy, to look at them when they don't want you to, to find out about them when they don't want you to, is to treat somebody, somebody's life, their naked body, their health information, their sexual intimacy, their tragedy, somebody else's life, as something simply for you to do something with. Maybe you want to entertain, maybe you want to make money, maybe you want to titillate. But the essential point is that it's you that's doing the choosing and not them. Now, those of you with a passing acquaintance of philosophy might recognise that these ideas are emanating from the late 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant. This is all about the idea of not treating somebody else as a means to your ends. The idea that you need instead to treat somebody as a chooser, just like yourself. Somebody who is just like you, trying to cast away through their life and making decisions about when and how they should be exposed to others. Now, this has been recognised in the New Zealand case law as the essence of the New Zealand privacy right. And so here's the leading privacy case, the New Zealand Court of Appeal decision, Hosking and Runting, this is Justice Tipping, saying it's the essence of the dignity and personal autonomy and well-being of all human beings that some aspects of their lives should be able to remain private if they so wish. Likewise, Brooker and Police, this is Justice Thomas in the Supreme Court. Probably no human right is more basic to human dignity than privacy. It's within a person's sphere of privacy that the person nurtures his or her autonomy and shapes his or her individual identity. I could give you similar quotes from the US and from English case law. So the language of dignity and autonomy was increasingly used in law to describe what it is that we're talking about when we look at breaches of privacy. And I think it's interesting too that we also hear this language, the language of dignity, coming through in the descriptions which individuals give, ordinary individuals give, of what it's like to have their privacy breached. So the first couple of quotes I'm going to have here come from um, family members of the men who were lost at Pike River. My colleague Yvette Tinsley and I have done an empirical study into um, the experiences those people had of the media in the aftermath of that event. This is some of, the, some of the words that they've used to describe what, the, how they felt they were being treated. We were just a story. We seemed violated by them all the time. We see the same language coming from the victims of phone hacking in the UK. These are the, this is the systematic phone hacking that was undertaken by tabloid newspapers against certain public figures. Some of them were phone hacked twice a day for seven years. These people have said, we were just pieces of news to be played with. Or we felt violated, we felt sickened, persecuted, hunted. So again, I think what we're seeing here is the language of Kant, the language of dignity. I think what these people are indignant about is the failure to treat them as people. We weren't being treated as people, we were being treated as a story, we were being treated as something to be used to the ends of the people who wanted to talk about us or to report about us. So that's the first reason why I think we should care. But it's important not to, it's important to emphasise that privacy isn't just about taking ourselves away from others. It's not just about sitting in a room and scribbling in our diary or heading to the hills to live as a hermit. Privacy is also a really important part of our interactions with one another. And so theorists in particular have acknowledged that privacy is necessary for the facilitation and the maintenance of relationships. Now my sister is in the audience. 
bless her. <laughs> now, I could invite her down here and we could have a conversation in front of you, but you wouldn't be surprised to hear that that would be a different conversation to the one that we would have if you weren't here, <laughs> if we were in our kitchen or if I was talking on the phone. And that should be, that's entirely as it should be, because the definition of intimacy, of friendship, of love, of familial ties, involves the idea that you disclose some things to your intimates that you don't disclose with others, that you share some things with them that you don't share with others. Now, in order to be able to do that, you need to be able to exclude others. We need to be able to be with our friends, to be with our lovers, to be with our intimates without other people being there. As one theorist puts it really nicely, Stanley Ben, we cannot carry on personal conversations under the same conditions as an open seminar. Now, again, we see that being played out in the case law and in popular discourse about privacy breaches. I think it's what we, is at the essence of celebrities' complaints when they're being followed around all the time by the paparazzi. Lord, for example, has complained about this kind of image, about the impact that it has on her ability to live a normal life. Dan Carter has complained about images of his son appearing and the impact that that has on his ability to create a normal family environment for him. And again, we also hear it played out in our, um, people explaining the effects of intrusions on their lives. Here again is a quote from, the, um, from a family member at Pike River. She's talking about the particular incident, which some of you will recall, when they came out of that meeting when they were told that the men had definitely died. So that she's, and she's talking about the effect of having the media there. She said, I really hated it because it was a private moment for the families. We just wanted to be with one another and support one another, but we couldn't do that outside because when you stopped and talked to another family member and you had your arms around them, the cameras were on you and they were just there. So not only is she objecting to the fact that the cameras were there, but she was saying the cameras took away that moment from them. It prevented the intimacy that they were seeking. So that's the second reason. That's the final one that I'm going to deal with. So what is it that I want everyone to take from this? Well, I guess the first thing is that privacy is important, that the right to be free from the searing effects of exposure is important. That's not to say, I should stress, it's not to say that they should always prevail, those interests, because there are very important rights on the other side. We have interests in open justice and we have interests in freedom of expression, which break down in terms of the right of the public to be informed, breaks down to your right to tell your own story, even though it might involve somebody else. And it's also about the right to expose wrongdoing, whether on a societal level or on a personal one. Those are very important rights which are weighed up against privacy. What I think we can insist on, though, is that when privacy squares off against these heavyweights, that it is a fair fight, that the privacy rights are properly understood and that they're properly articulated so that they can weigh against things like access to justice and freedom of expression on a, at least on, a, on an equal footing where appropriate. Thank you. I'll hand over to Martin. Yeah, welcome everybody. My name is Marcin Betke. Uh, as Nicole said, I'm a PhD student here and, and uh, I would like to talk to you about uh, collection, data collection. And uh, it will be focused more on, on why should we care about, about online data collection because, because uh, there are several reasons for this. We'll go move along this, this agenda or this map uh, First, to show the, the online commercial environment, because I will focus on the online commercial environment. Uh, then, uh, just to pick up some mechanisms which are not visible for everybody, which, which uh, are, are there. Uh, then I'll talk about the harm, because the harm is not, uh, is not obvious. The effects of, of, uh, of the data collection uh, may be postponed, or, or there are risks which may eventuate, eventuate later, or, or, or people may be not aware about the, the effects. And I will uh, briefly cover the legal, the legal response, or the problems with, uh, with legal response. So let's, uh, uh, let's go to the uh, commercial environment. The, the purpose of this, of this slide is just to, 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 to show that, that uh, there is an online architecture which is set up uh, to collect as much data as possible to, to, to generate profits. Basically, and uh, maybe it's quite obvious that that the uh, communication over online is mediated by uh, 
by computers. Uh, but it has some profound uh, consequences. First, we don't, we don't have all those uh, facial displays, uh, emotions, gesture, voice. We don't have it. We, don't, we, don't, we cannot communicate on this level. Second is that the other side are the machines, usually. They, they, uh, they serve the service providers. It's especially seen when we are entering the contract. We just see the form, which is pre-designed pre for us. We just click the form, and we are entering into agreement with, with some service provider. And the second thing is that, that uh, about architecture. Architecture in the, of the online is, is created by the software, by the code, which was, uh, which was a program, programming language, which was uh, found out but, or, or, or named by Lawrence Lessig, the American law professor. And this online architecture, that programming language, creates uh, as much as uh, uh, the corridors or the paths of our, of our online movement, as much as the, the physical architecture we, we normally see here. And that architecture of the online is designed, designed fully by the service providers, so by the uh, corporations or, or, or enterprises which uh, websites we are we are entering usually websites but maybe applications as well and <clears throat> sorry what's uh, what's quite uh, visible in the last time is that uh, all of our data or of our uh, digital tracks are are recorded somehow because uh, because the data recording is easy because uh, of the technological progress and uh, because we leave more data it, it can be data we leave in 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 the web search the words or the letters we type it can be things we we see we think we click we think we like on the on the facebook for example uh, that may be about our behaviors that may be about our relations that may be about our interests or things we are looking for online so uh, and that may be about our location as well, because we move with our, with our electronic devices, which, uh, which records uh, our geolocation, which records uh, the, the networks which we are in the range of. So in all these data are, are stored somewhere, uh, or there are companies who would like to store them, because they are generating, they are profiling us. They are thinking about, about us as a, uh, our data as a possibility to gain, to gain, to to make profit on uh, on targeting advertisement uh, towards us. So we sooner or later will pay for this in in the in the price of products. However, uh, what we leave is, is our ever better uh, online profiles. And as I said, the the collection is is usually set by default. This slide is about information asymmetry, because uh, what we see uh, on what we know about the service providers or how we, how we think uh, when entering the online environment, uh, how we perceive it is completely different than how it looks like. There is on the right side, we have the, the quite uh, famous uh, picture from a study of, of Debatin and others about the Facebook iceberg model. What we see is that, that, that the so on what's on the surface, so what is, uh, this is a service which is provided for us to communicate, to talk to people. Uh, however, uh, what we do not usually see is the second side of this market, which is invisible, which is where our, all of our data are, are, are mined, are stored, and are aggregated, and reorganized in just to, to, to make, to generate some, some profits. And that, uh, that specific business logic is that one side of the market is to lure customer to, to provide some service which is usually or very often for free, while the profit comes from the other side, other side of the market. And this kind of logic is quite uh, popular in, uh, in online environments. So we are a product, in fact, on that, on that market. And it starts to bear some resemblance to, to, to what Nicole said about, about dignity and about autonomy. So we see differentiated ads because they are based on our profiles, we more often see differentiated prices because if the service, if service providers knows about us a lot, so why not to show us different products or different prices based on what we, what, we, what we can pay? And there's a quite important aspect of this is that negative externality. It's just an economic term for, 
for uh, simple uh, true that, that the, all the negative uh, costs of, of, of uh, misuse of data are borne by customers, not by, by service providers, because data are describing us. Uh, and uh, if the data is misused, and unless it's, of course, uh, data leak and, and, and the particular service provider is shamed publicly, uh, all the costs or the negative consequences are, are, are on us. We are bearing with the risk of, of data theft and, and security and, and so on and so on. Uh, that's a short, uh, as short as possible, uh, look at the, on the economy of the, of the, of the digital environment. Since uh, it shows it's a value chain analysis, uh, strategic management analysis, which goes through from the production of, the, of, of, of online product or services towards consumption on the, on the right. And uh, I show here, I'll show it here just to, to show how the, uh, the same names, the same, uh, how the, the value chains is being integrated by, by the same companies. You can see the same names or subsidiaries in different parts of this, of this value chain. And uh, that shows how this online, because it's, it's, the internet is global, the companies are global, the services are global. So they uh, basically uh, expand on many different markets. They are cross-jurisdictional, uh, which uh, makes harder to, to pin it, pin them with, with some, some particular laws, because, because we are divided to, to countries. We don't have any global, global legislation. And so uh, maybe the only, the only place here uh, one more thing: the companies operating on those on those links usually compete or cooperate with each other. If, the, if that link, that all the that value chain is being integrated, it means that there is one company which basically uh, governs all aspects of of, of product uh, delivery to the to the customer. I would just want would like to put emphasis on on the right side on device and operating system that. We are more and more uh, supposed to, to log into our own devices. We are providing some, some uh, uh, unique uh, identifier. We have to log into our, to our device just to, 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 to identify us, which, uh, which is kind of change, kind of trend which we see uh, last time uh, from, I don't know, 10 years. While we used to own our devices and own our software, which could make some kind of, of mediation for us, which makes some work, some work for us, right now we are logging to, to, the, to the software which is provided by, by service providers. Probably the only part of this chain which is not integrated is connectivity one. I think in this, uh, in this aspect, it's, it's about network. It's about providing the infrastructure and the network and the internet itself. But think about the projects of uh, providing internet by drones or balloons in this context, and it's, that's, about, that's, that's exactly about the last lacking part of the, of the chain. So, so where's the, car, the harm? Uh, I put this, uh, this picture of, of, of Panopticon. Panopticon is, is uh, is a model of, of Jeremy Bentham model of, of discipline mechanism of, of a prison. He was trying to, 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 to create a, a perfect prison, a place where, where which would be, uh, minimize the costs and maximize the efficiency of disciplinary mechanism. Uh, so build it in the architecture in that way that, that all the inmates, all the, the prisoners would be feeling observed, but they couldn't verify whether the power is whether they are observed in their, any specific moment. They just didn't know whether they are observed, in the, but they know that they could be observed. So they have to be, uh, behave in a, in a, in a specific uh, manner. So if we think about this, this particular uh, characteristics of panopticon mechanism, so architecture as a, as a mean to, to organize the, the, the whole thing, uh, the asymmetrical visibility, so that, that you are seen but you cannot see the other side, and the individualization of the each inmate in each of his own cell. We can think about online as a as it's, it's a quite good uh, good uh, concept uh, to to describe what's happening online. Michel Foucault, in about 40 years ago, generalized about that 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 panopticon mechanism, and he saw that that that, that it's not only the, the the prison itself; it's it's uh, it's somehow in 
people are just integrating that that surveillance mechanism into into the the models of of uh, different apparatuses, different institutions like prison, not only prison but army, school, and the. He saw it 40 years ago, and and uh, we have yeah, what we see. Uh, what are the effects on this? The effects is that it's not a, a voluntary uh, relation where we are partners. We are entering the contract and we are dealing with some services. It's a disciplinary mechanism. It creates sub subordination, not uh, not cooperation. The chilling effect. Chilling effect is is if we know that we are observed and that we are traced and all our our uh, moves are, are recorded, we, we change our uh, behavior. Imagine that if I would uh, ask for questions and uh, put with, uh, just uh, put a stand here that all your questions would be recorded and streamlined on the internet. Whether you would be probably not think twice whether, whether you would like to ask the question or not, because, because it would be fully public. Yeah? Uh, and those those effects are, are are basically based on the same on the same values as uh, as were described by uh, by Nicole. Uh, it creates risks as well. Risks that that, that uh, if we are individualized, profiled, that our uh, deficiencies are exposed somehow. Will be exposed. Discrimination factors, for example. Even if we do not really uh, target, uh, do not really put people into the, uh, under the labels of different races, of different uh, incomes, it will turn out in the, in the massive data collection sooner or later. Abuse of power, risk of abuse of power is the risk of abuse of power of service provider. Risk of data leak is, is, is not fully managed by service provider. It happens when, the, when he's uh, lose control over, over the data. Uh, the harm in uh, more tangible probably for you about when when these risks are eventuated. I put some 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 a lot of examples here, but I will uh, go through it very quickly. Uh, first is the economic exploitation. It's that when our data are used to uh, to generate more profits from us and first to collect more data and and there were a couple of cases here that that. Uh, uh, companies were overriding our protection mechanism to not to leave data on the websites. Uh, there were cases where the, the data were uh, used uh, to target the vulnerable. Uh, for example, American, American uh, data brokers were selling the list of people which they called suckers list, uh, which were uh, basically people who were vulnerable. They could enter. Uh, any kind of contract, basically, by the people uh, who are targeting them, with the people who are target, targeting them. Uh, there are product manipulations. I hear more and more about different prices for the same services based off of, of, of who is asking or who is looking. Remember that you are on the website that you don't see the offer which is targeted to everybody, but you see the offer which is targeted exactly at you. So, uh, especially with with uh, Mm, buy when you're trying to buy something which is one off and with a higher price. That's the moment when, when uh, like a, I know air tickets, for example. Uh, abusing occasion uh, is uh, think about, for example, uh, Uber surge of prices during ter terrorist attacks in in Sydney. There is a particular moment where people were looking for. Uh, we can say about think about it as, a, as a pure market mechanism because demand was was so huge that people will, will, uh, were willing to pay more for taxi. But if you think about it for a while, it, it's, it's not that you are looking for a taxi and, and uh, trying to escape from the terrorist attack and you, you expect to be charged, uh, I don't know, I don't remember exactly, seven times more or eight times more uh, how it was. So the second thing is the autonomy, autonomy trap. And that's more about the, uh, our perception of the world and uh, what we see. We used to see, to meet some things or people which, are, which were random. If we move along the, the paths which are, which are pre-designed, we are in a kind of bubble. We see what, what we are supposed to see, and uh, we lose the full picture. Try to make the, the same web search uh, on two browsers or uh, put the same, the same uh, 
web selection, web, the same terms in your browser, you and the, somebody else, you will see that the, 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 the search results are different. So we no more have this serendipity, so, so ability to, 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 to think, to, to spot something random. We may uh, have problems with freedom of thoughts because we are um, coining our ideas about uh, the reality, about the, the world, by looking for, for, for things on the web. If we want to look for, 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 any, for everything, we just will be targeted toward, towards some specific, uh, specific ideas. Uh, and this final slide is about legal response, or, or to be honest, of the problems with, of legal response, because it's not, it's, um, the response can, can be, can approach from different, different kind, different sorts of law, different branches of law. However, uh, it's a problem for contract law with uh, notice and consent model. We, we are entering the agreements, but it's, uh, there is a problem with consent as people prefer to the instant gratification, the instant joining the network, the, the social network, or, or making a search or doing search. Uh, I don't think about prolonged consequences, and that's, that's, it's in our nature. So that's, it's quite questionable whether consent, not the consent model, is, is, is the right one to to uh, to govern this. Uh, data privacy laws are suffering because because the, the services are global, so it's a kind of race to the bottom that 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 uh, we are as much protected as the as the weakest uh, legislation the data is, 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 is processed in. Competition law is, is, is designed to, to deal with uh, economic harms. It's kind of quite hard to pin the exact amount of money we, we, we are losing. So we need to step back somehow and think about the good solution because I think the problem of privacy is, is from, the, from the beginning. Is, uh, Maybe even to, to, to think about the definition, how we perceive, how we perceive privacy, because privacy may be perceived as something which we are trying to hide or trying to, to protect in negative terms, or maybe perceived as something that we are, we are managing, actively managing our, our, uh, our information, our privacy, we are re revealing some information towards people, and maybe we would like to, to manage our privacy. My idea for this is, is that, uh, that we would like to, to actively manage our privacy, and, and the, the law should uh, give us some tools which uh, allow us to retract our decision from at some point, to, to be able to, to think about the whole process of, of privacy. And uh, yeah, and that's basically this. That we need to think about to reverse or neutralize this panopticon mechanism. And I think that's, that's all from me, from my side. Thank you for coming.